Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Diana from the Library of Congress, and I am very happy to be here this afternoon with K.A. Holt, whose featured book at the festival is Bendy and the Teacher Griefer. If you'd like to see K.A.'s presentation at the festival, please log in to nationalbookfestival.com and find her previously recorded on-demand video. This question and answer session will be driven by your questions. So please do populate the chat box with questions for KA. And I see them coming in already, excellent. So let's begin the conversation. Our first question uh, for UK coming in from Emily. Did you ever play any video games growing up? <laughs> What video games are your kids playing? And which ones are you playing mostly with your kids? Okay, well, so I played um, Oregon Trail. That was the big one for me. <laughs> um, I am old, so we had, you know, like one computer in our school. And if you got your homework done or your schoolwork done early, you could go play Oregon Trail. Um, I loved that. I loved all of the um, Carmen San Diego games. I liked playing um, anything. We had a TI 49A uh, computer growing up, so I played Parsec, and uh, my friend had an Atari, and uh, we would play uh, like Dragon Slayer or something like that. Um, we uh, so I I played all of those kinds of games, and then as I got older, um, I couldn't keep up with the 360 whatever that you have to be able to do, and so I was out after that. Um, my kids play all all the games that all the kids play. Right now, we were just talking before we started filming that um, Animal Crossing was using all my bandwidth. Um, so we had to go shut that down for a minute. We have <laughs> we have two islands. It's just chaotic. So yes, we play a lot of video games. And my, my, um, uh, my son, uh, who helped inspire Ben B by playing so many video games that I had to bribe him um, that I would play with him um if he would read um he got me interested in skyrim which is cool there's like a big dragon so, so yeah we're a bit of a video game family but i'm not really that good at any of them <laughs> excellent thank you oregon trail and atari bringing back fond memories <laughs> our next question is from katie have you ever thought about writing a book for young adult kids high school age who say they hate to read <laughs> I have. Um, it's funny because um, there are often discussions uh, between me and my editors when I um, when I'm writing these books. Like when I was writing House Arrest, um, I, I sort of intended it to be more YA, but really just the voice that I have is a middle grade voice. And so, uh, like Redwood and Ponytail is another novel in verse that I thought might be YA, um, but I think that the the topics that I am drawn to and the characters I am drawn to tend to feel more middle grade. So even if I did write a young adult novel, I think the criticism would be that it feels middle grade because it's not gonna have some of the grittier things that YA books have. Um, that's not to say that I wouldn't give it a whirl because um, I, I would like to. And I, I really think those high-low books are important. Um, but I would encourage you that if you have high school students, like if they read a book uh, like House Arrest, one of my other books, or uh, Redwood and Ponytail, they're not going to feel like they're spoken down to. You know, I don't I, I work really hard to make sure that kids and really people of all ages can read these books and get a lot out of them. So even though they're technically like marketing has called them middle grade, I don't think that they would be um, boring or too young for high school readers. All right, thank you. Our next question from Amber. How does your synesthesia influence your writing process? <laughs> so this one is fun because what happens is I will write something like the teacher walked into the room um, and she uh, clapped brightly three times like that. Because to me, that's like a flash of light, flash of light, flash of light, or like a yellow flash or something like that, her yellow clapping. Um, and my editor will be like, I do not think that this makes sense. I'm not sure that anybody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> and so I have to think about it more and figure out a way um, to phrase it in a way that everyone will understand. Um, I think it really helps write poetry because it's kind of built in without even realizing it. The 
just the way that I see things or describe things tends to come out a, a little more poetically because there's uh, people see it as an analogy, whereas sometimes I don't see it as an analogy. I just see it as how it is, you know, if that makes sense. So uh, other than causing arguments between my editor and I, I think that it it's nice. It helps. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> and we, we have a question here from Alan. Did your son end up discovering a book he loved when you bribed him to read? If so, <laughs> what book or books? Well, it's it's really interesting. He goes through these phases. He really fell in love with the Big Nate books. Um, and he read every single Big Nate book that he could get his hands on. And then all he wanted to do was find other books like that, but no other book could live up to Big Nate. And so he just read those over and over and over again. And so recently, um, I've been now he's in seventh grade now and um, we've been reading some graphic novels and I got Flamer um, that just came out and he's really loved that and um, he and my daughter both are, they read Lumberjanes so um, we've moved into graphic novels and he's moving a little more into some novel novels but he really will find a favorite and if he can't find anything that's like that he doesn't want to read anything new so he'll just keep reading the same thing over and over again which you know I understand. I do that. I do that too. So as long as I can get him to read a little bit, I'm happy. Right. He is not alone in that. <laughs> All right. Oscar would like to know, why did you decide to become a writer? <laughs> well, my, so my jokey answer to this is that I'm not really good at anything else. So I had to, I had to make it as a writer because professional roller skater wasn't going to work. Um, <laughs> but I mean, what I really like to do is I really like to tell stories and I really like to make people feel seen and understood. And so um, I had thought for a long time I was going to go into art history and or work in a museum and help like create educational programs and things like that, um, which I think I would have loved. But then I was in college. I took a playwriting course and I loved that. And so I talked my way into a job being a professional writer, which was working in advertising. Um, and I realized that that didn't fulfill that same kind of feeling that you get telling stories, you know, when someone else is telling you what to say in advertising copy, it's just not the same. Um, and I was good at it, but I didn't love it. And, um, and then I started to really hate it. And then I started thinking maybe I could actually have a career as a writer and how could I do that? So I've always wanted to write. I think it took a long time for me to realize that I could write fiction and make a job out of it. And it's been challenging to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm not, not really good at many other things. So I'm very, very fortunate that I've been able to make this work. We're glad you're writing. <laughs> okay, uh, Karen has a question and um, a little context here. She says, I am a third and fourth grade teacher and my student Samir wants to know what works of fiction are you working on now? Because he is super excited. And he would also, uh, he want, also wants to know if you were a superhero, who would you be? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll start with the, <laughs> the first one. So Ben B um, in The Teacher Griever is actually the first book in a series of four books. Um, if you read Ben B, you'll see that the story is told from four points of view. So each character is going to get their own book, which is very cool. Um, and I just finished uh, going over the copy edits for Ben Y, her book. Um, and I think it might be called Ben Y and the Ghost in the Machine, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm probably not even supposed to tell you that. So we'll see um, what, that, uh, what that title ends up being. And it'll be out... Um, pretty much like this time next year. And then uh, Jordan will have his own book and Javier will have his own book. So uh, those are keeping me quite busy. Um, and uh, I have another project that I'm working on that hasn't been announced yet, so I can't tell you anything about it, but it's gonna be cool too. Um, so yeah, I'm doing a lot of writing right now. And I don't know about the superhero thing. I'm gonna think about that. Like uh, people always wanna know like what superpower would you wanna have, you know? And I think my superpower would be stopping time is the one that I would want. I'd want to be able to pause 
you know, to like really enjoy a cool moment or if I have got stuff coming up that I need to think about more or whatever, if I could just pause things. I don't know what superhero can do that. So whatever superhero can do that, that's the one I want to be. All right, just be myself and do that. Interesting <laughs> superpower. Excellent. Susan would like to know, what is your writing process? My writing process is like 95% laying on the floor going, ah. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard. And um, writing, you would think after so many books, it gets easier, but it really doesn't. And so what I tend to do now is write that messy first draft and it is messy. Like if you saw the first draft of most of my books and then the final published version, it, they almost are indistinguishable. They're completely different books a lot of times. Um, I tend to get to know my characters first. So what happens is I work really hard on a first draft and turn it in and then my editor is like, I love this character, this is gonna be great. And what we need to work on now is a plot. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, fabulous. So I just spent like a year writing the story with no plot. So I. It's pretty much characters first, then story. Um, I've started, what I do is I print out a lot of my work and I lay it on the floor so that I can get an idea of which chapters are too short and which ones are too long. Um, I like to assign um, any kind of subplot with colors. So when I lay it all out on the floor, I will have like all these different markers in my pocket and I can assign each one like circle purple for every time I talk about a spaceship or something. So I can see where it fits in the story. I'm very visual. So um, it's a big, messy, wild process. Um, and I've just switched over to uh, these sticky, um, they're like, it's like little whiteboard sticky notes that you can put on the window or the wall. And I'm trying to use those to help me figure out my stories rather than printing out so much paper. So we'll see how that goes. Sticky notes, excellent tools. Our <laughs> next question, do you think you would write a graphic novel? I would love to write a graphic novel, but when I have sat down to really think about doing it, like how it works, it's, it's, it's a lot like storyboarding a movie. And that's a completely different way to think about how a story is written. So I feel like I might need to take a class. I, need, I would need some instruction on how to do that. Um, that said, uh, the character in the Ben B series, the Kids Under the Stairs series, there's a character named Javier, and Javier does almost all of his communication via drawings. And so in Ben B and the Teacher Creeper, I did Javier's drawings, which is really hard. Um, and so his book, well, I don't really know what that's gonna look like yet. Uh, so it might, I mean, it's ostensibly gonna have uh, a pretty considerable graphic, uh, format to it now will it be graphic novelly or novelly with graphics i don't know yet um but i have some time to try to figure out how to do it right because i don't really like to do anything unless i know it's right which is also uh, a hurdle sometimes <laughs> okay very good our next question coming in from ashley what differences in learning are you planning to incorporate in your future projects? Um, well, right now, um, Ben Y is a lot about, um, not a lot about, but so we touch on dyslexia in her book and we touch on anxiety. Um, and Jordan's book is going to touch on um, what it's like to, to be one of these kids who's uh, ADHD and super smart, but you just, you don't fit into that school system, you know, that's sitting in a desk uh, all day. Um, ben B and the Teacher Griefer talks about dysgraphia um, and um, Javier's story is about uh, how he stutters and the way that, um, that affects how he deals with school and the way that it affects how um, educators and other students deal with him. So uh, all kinds of different learning differences are um, on the table right now that um, I've been uh, researching and talking to people with and just things that I've experienced in my own life and my own family that uh, I could put in a book to help some kids feel seen. Okay, thank you. And next up from Emily. Emily says, my oldest loved dog, dog man books. What would you suggest in order to get him to read more chapter books and discover a love for reading broader than dog man? <laughs> See, these things are hard because it's, because like one of the hardest parts is to find the books that the kids love. 
right? And then you have to figure out how, I hate the word pivot now, everyone's ruined the word pivot, but to pivot from the, those books. Um, I don't know, I mean, the trick is to try to find something that's that overlaps just a little bit. You know, if you can find another Dave Pilkey that's closer to more of a chapter book, or if you can find something um, like if you go on uh, Goodreads or wherever, talk to a librarian who says, uh, you know, if you like this, then you will like that. Um, and then just kind of ease them into it. It's tricky. I mean, I don't think it's bad for him to read the Dogman books 50 million times. Um, I grew up, I read all the Anastasia comics over and over and over and over again, all those books I read, um, Harriet the Spy over and over. I was in ninth grade and I was teased for reading baby books because I just didn't want to read Stephen King like the other kids where I wanted to keep reading Anastasia. And, uh, and at the time it was embarrassing, but I think it served me well. So I know it drives you crazy probably that he's not having a broader, you know, reading whatever, but, uh, it's okay, I think, to, to ease into what he likes. So that way he doesn't feel the pressure of this isn't okay and this is what they want and I don't want what they want and I'm not going to do it. And, you know. Thank you. Encouraging. <laughs> Next from Laura. For new writers, what is the path to publishing a middle grade book once you have a draft written? Are there any Ooh. pitfalls to avoid? Well, I think the number one pitfall you have already avoided, which is having a draft written. Um, <laughs> a lot of times people really just want to jump right in and, you know, you've got your three chapters and you're querying agents and they think that that sounds great and it's exciting. And then they're like, send me the full and you're like, oh, no. So having a draft written. Good job. That is something that I didn't know when I started writing and I was querying with only three or four chapters written and that was not a great move. Um, but I figured it out. So um, that's my, the path that I took, um, which is a path that I suggest <laughs> because it worked, but it was hard is, you know, you finish your draft, you query agents. It's hard to know which agent um, is the right one for you. So you look at other books that you like and other authors that you, um, you respect and careers that you uh, like the trajectory of and you find out who their agents are. And then those are the agents you query um, with a letter that's like, hey, you know, I've been following so-and-so's career for quite some time and um, I love their books and, you know, my books are different, but similar in this and this and this or whatever. And then you pitch your book. And luckily, if you get lucky, you know, if, if you're doing all right, you find your agent and then your agent reaches out to editors and it takes a long time. It took a long time for me to find an editor that I really could click with. And now I'm lucky to have a couple editors that I click with so that we can pitch them work. And it's not just a full out to the whole industry all the time when you're on sub, because that's hard. I mean, you just, you have to believe in your work and you have to believe in yourself. The pitfall is always trying, always comparing yourself to other people and thinking this person is doing better than I am. Why is that? Because the, you're not on the same path as that other writer. You're on your own path to success, if that makes sense. So while you can say, I like the trajectory of this person's career, it's better for you to try not to compare yourself to them. That's, that's the downfall. When you can start hearing critics' voices in your head and letting that get to you you just it's hard but you have to you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe in the stories that you're telling and then just push and push and push until those stories get published thank you we will remember that our next question is from jean jean says banned books week starts today ah, today <laughs> can you talk a little bit about some schools that canceled your visits and if you can't don't worry, we will move on to the next question. <laughs> well, so here's the thing that happens with me is that um, my visits get rather, I mean, there have been some that have been canceled um, that no, pe people have learned that if you cancel an author visit by saying, you are not welcome in our school because you are gay or you, your books are not welcome in our school because of the LGBT content. People are learning not to say that now. 
because they know there will be blowback. Uh, so what they do is they say, we're going to truncate your visit to only speak to five students instead of, you know, a thousand students, here's your check, goodbye. Um, which is different and also terrible and kind of more terrible, honestly. Um, so I have had both of the, I've had many of those things happen and, and really like, the only thing I can do is to try to call attention to it. Not necessarily, I mean, depending on what happens, but mm -hmm. not necessarily to call out the specific school or educator, because I think a lot of times it's parent parental pressure that they are afraid of, um, but to just call out the situation. Because what I want is for people to be aware that these things happen. Um, and I think that a lot of us live in, uh, in a bubble where we, we believe, you know, there are bad guys who ban books by just piling them in the street and setting them on fire. But what we don't realize is that there are guys who are not bad guys, but who are afraid of losing their jobs and who say, I won't order these books to put in my library because I don't want to deal with the noisy parents. And so drawing attention to that kind of thing so that we can try to make that stop um, is, is better, I think, than like, I don't know, it's not better, it's just something that I feel that is important that I, I want to do. I want to help schools have books for all kids in their libraries and I wanna help them feel like they have resources to argue against the noisy people because the noisy people are not the majority, but for some reason they always seem to win and I don't want that to keep happening. So uh, being, me being boy, noisy in kind of a broad way, I think, is a way to combat these kinds of soft censorship, censorship, uh, uninvited kind of thing. Very good, thank you for addressing that. Our next question is from Beth. Are there other fictional books about a character with synesthesia that you feel like really get it or help diversify the narrative? And do you think that those authors need a personal experience of synesthesia to share that experience with others? Those are, that's, those are very interesting questions. So I will say that um, I know there are synesthesia books. I think there are some YA books that have come out recently, but I have not read them. So I can't really speak to how how it's done in those books. Um, I can say, I mean, a person not having synesthesia writing a book about it is kind of like any other thing, a person, like I'm writing a character who stutters and I do not stutter. So I'm coming at it from a perspective that's adjacent, right? And that's not always the greatest place to be when you're a writer. So you really have to surround yourself with people who have that experience and have that lived experience and you need to have them read your work and tell you um, what you're not doing right, you know, things that you can change to make it more realistic. I think a synesthesia story would be the same um, as anything else. And like, it's never going to be the same as a story that is written by someone who has experienced it. Uh, it's not. Um, but I think as long as your readers understand that you are coming at it from kind of an adjacent thing and that you are doing the work that you need to do um, to tell that story, then, you know, it'll be okay. Okay, thank you. And Oscar would like to know, if I want to become a writer, what advice would you give me? <laughs> I'm gonna give you the advice that Paula Danziger gave me when I uh, saw her give a speech um, when I was in middle school. And um, what she wrote on a napkin for me was, Dear Carrie Ann, keep reading and keep writing. And I know that that sounds like really simple advice, but it is the best advice I think anyone has ever given me because I don't have an MFA in creative writing and I could go get one, you know, I could, you can go through school and you can take all the creative writing classes you want. And I think that's absolutely valid. I also think it's absolutely valid to just read as much as you possibly can. Read books that you like, read books you don't like, read books you've never heard of before, read magazines, read newspapers, read signs in the street, read 
anything you can get your hands on because what that's going to do is it's going to teach you how stories are structured and it's going to teach you how you can learn the rules of how to tell a story and not even know that you've learned them because it just becomes part of you because you've read so many stories and you are influenced by things that you never knew that you would be influenced by so just always keep reading uh, have get a pen pal that's another thing like when i was a kid we didn't have email so we i moved away um, from florida to texas in eighth grade and i wrote letters to all my friends and my friend amy wrote me the greatest letters and she wrote like in the margins and upside down and i was still doing like i had learned in school you know dear amy comma space date and i had no idea that you could do these crazy things in these letters and so just getting letters from my best friend was a huge influence on how i became a writer so read read write write learn the rules so you can break them those are my that's my advice and get those pen pals everyone great <laughs> yeah. memories there katie asks as a parent yourself what would you say to parents who fear allowing their kids to read quote banned books <laughs> So here's, here's a thing I heard a librarian say a, a couple of years ago, and what she said was parents ban books ostensibly a lot of times because they're trying to protect children. Um, and we live in a world where we, we cannot really protect them. We can prepare them, and by preparing them for the world, that will protect them. So. I say to parents who are afraid of kids to read these books or who want to ban books, um, what, they, what they're trying to do is ban the world that we live in, right? And you cannot do that. You cannot send a child into the world completely unprepared for what they are about to face. And a lot of times there are children in schools who have faced horrible things, unimaginable things for young children, sixth graders, seventh graders. So books that privileged parents try to remove from the library because they are too adult or they are too graphic or they are too whatever. This is the life that those kids see. And these are books that will save lives. So I think it's important to take yourself out of your own head, right? Pull it back, you know, look down from the moon and try to see this town and the school and this classroom of all these kids made up of experiences that we have not had and think about how do we support them and show them love and send them into a world where they feel prepared rather than totally blind to what's about to come, you know? Thank you. And what kind of books do you like to read? I like to read all kinds of books. Um, <laughs> it, depends, it depends on my mood and it depends on if I'm writing because if I'm writing a book, it's really hard for me to read at that moment. So I will read nonfiction or essays. I really love going back and reading E.B. White's um, essays that he used to write back in the 40s and 50s, 30s. He, uh, they're all still so relevant, some of them. It's really, he has, they're calming to me. I love those. And right now I'm reading um, Ali Brosh, who wrote Hyperbole and a Half. Um, she has a new graphic book out that's called uh, Solutions and Other Problems. And um, I'm making my way through that one right now. It's so good. Very good. And that was Elan's question as well, your current read. And with about one minute left, a uh, question from Emily. What is your research process for preparing to write your books? Uh, my research process is typically stealing things from my children. Um, <laughs> it is being fortunate enough to visit middle schools all over the country. I mean, that's slowed down tremendously right now, but um, putting myself into the world of the kids that uh, the stories that I want to tell. Um, my research process for my fiction a lot is just my own life, um, taking things out of my own life. Um, when I have started researching historical fiction books that I would like to write, I get so mired in the research that I forget to write the book. So that is something that I'm going to have to work on if I ever want a historical fiction book. Um, really, my research process right now is just opening my eyes and trying to be an observer in this world. Excellent. And one final question that relates to the last question you just answered. From Lisa, what is your process when you are writing books with characters using different forms of writing? 
Ah, so like in Ben B, where I have characters with free verse and I have characters who are written in stream of consciousness and um, illustration. Um, the process is just figuring out the voice of that character and how that character talks. Uh, people ask, you know, how did House Arrest, uh, why did I decide to write that in free verse? And it's not that I decided to write it in free verse, it's that that's Timothy's voice. That is just how he wanted to tell the story. So Ben B wants to tell the story in this way. This is, this is an immediacy in his brain. And Jordan talks in stream of consciousness because that's just how he talks, that's how he sees the world. Everything that he sees comes out of his mouth. He doesn't think about it. So I get to know the characters and then the characters tell me what, uh, how I'm going to, how I'm going to write them. Excellent. And all right, we are unfortunately out of time. It is 4.30. So thank you, K.A., for so generously sharing your time, your life experiences and your insights with us. We have Thank been you. speaking with K.A. Holt, whose latest book is Bendy and the Teacher Griefer. Thank, there it is. Excellent. Beautiful B on the cover there. Thanks as well to our audience. Please do stay connected with the Library of Congress through our online resources. And everyone, come vis visit us when we reopen.